Hi, everybody. Juleka here. I'm the host and creator of How to Talk to Mommy and Papi About Anything. And I want to invite you to be on our show. If you're an adult and a child of immigrants from anywhere in the world, I'd love to talk to you about those conversations that are hard but necessary. Things about politics, dating, career, parenting. Seriously, no topic is off limits. Send us an email at hello at talktomommypapi.com and let's get you on the show. That's hello at talktomommypapi.com. See you soon. Hi, everybody. Today, we're so happy to have Sylvia on the show. Sylvia was passionate about a career as a university professor, and her Peruvian parents were always her biggest supporters. But once in academia, Sylvia faced significant challenges that left her discouraged and confused. And when she had to make really big and really risky career decisions, it was hard to explain to her family why she needed to move on from her dream job. Let's get into it. My name is Sylvia. I'm a first-generation Peruvian American, and I was born and raised in Miami, Florida. And I call my parents mommy and papi. Growing up in my family, my parents um, worked really hard, multiple jobs to send my sister and I to private school. And education was definitely uh, prioritized in my family. So early on in my graduate training, I knew that I wanted to become um, a professor and in particular pursue a tenure track faculty position. And I was fortunate to be able to accomplish that. And it was essentially my dream job. That's, that's what I pursued my PhD for, and I was very excited that it happened. When I think back to the challenges that I experienced in the tenure track faculty position, the one that kind of really hit hard for me um, was when it came time for me to apply for um, tenure. And so the way it usually goes in most programs, including the program that I was in, when you apply for tenure, you also apply for promotion. So it usually goes kind of hand in hand. And so when it came to end of my fourth year, fifth year, I was getting ready to submit my application. And essentially, I was told that I could only apply for promotion, not tenure. The reasons for I was given was that they were working on the tenure policy and updating it, and it wasn't ready to be finalized. And so I had to wait. I was shocked. That's not what my understanding of the procedure and the policy was. There were several meetings that I had with the chair and eventually got to the provost. And it just became clear that I was probably not going to have the opportunity to apply for tenure in the near future. And so I decided it was time to move on and decided to do a job search and look for other positions. So when I shared with my parents that I was leaving, they were definitely supportive in my decision. But at the same time, I could sense sadness in that sharing it with my dad. His initial response was, but you've put in so much time. You've put in so many years. It was hard. It was hard to hear that. I always think of my parents when I make these decisions and when I have these opportunities because they came from the sacrifices that they made. I ended up going a different route and I went into academic medicine, which to be honest, initially was not what I wanted to do. That's not why I pursued a PhD. And that really didn't hit me until I started this new job and I started seeing patients and it was just a, wow, this is not what you want to do. And so it turned into first disappointment and sadness and then I got angry. And although I could never get the tenure status that I would have wanted, I knew that there was an opportunity to create change. And to me, that involved changing the system. And the best way to do that was filing a lawsuit against this university um, for what I experienced as being blocked um, from applying for tenure. When I was explaining the reason behind why I was filing a lawsuit to my parents, I really emphasized the aspect about the systemic inequities and I definitely did not use the word inequities because I didn't even know how to translate that directly. Yeah, I don't even know how to say it in Spanish. (laughs) That was hard for my parents to understand. They ended up in a community that's very Latino. So they're surrounded by Latinos. Many of their providers are Latinos, physicians, nurses. And so I had to break it down and remind them that that wasn't the case in all my academic spaces. So I was the, the only Latina for the most part in my graduate program only Latina in my fellowship, and then also the only Latina in my junior faculty position. But in addition to that, I was usually the only person of color. And that was something that I don't think my parents had ever thought about nor realized. They saw it like, 
well, you and your sister pursued graduate school and you were able to do it and you made it, right? Quote, made it so others can do it. But they didn't realize that that's not necessarily the case. I was very fortunate that I had a mentor in my undergraduate years that took me under her wing when I joined her research lab. And she helped me figure out how to get into graduate school, reviewed my essays, told me about the jury. I would have not known how to navigate all that to get into a PhD program. And then I brought up the statistic about faculty being tenured. And that's around 5% of Latinos, Latinos or Latinas, are tenured faculty. That kind of lens they never saw. I eventually decided to end the lawsuit for personal reasons. It was absolutely one of the hardest decisions I had to make. And also it was really hard to share that with my dad in particular, because he was my biggest cheerleader in this whole process. The part that still continues to be hard for for my parents to understand is that, yes, I had this significant event happen in my first tenure track faculty position. Unfortunately, that's not the only one. There's other challenges that have happened since then. And when they have happened and I've shared them with my parents, there's still kind of a surprise like, oh, I can't believe that happened. And so to me, that shows that they haven't fully understood that this is common. This is common for people of color. This is common for Latinos, common for Black women or many others of color. We have a long way to go. And I think my parents still have a little bit of ways to go to fully understand that as long as I stay in academia, there probably will be these other bumps. And that's just part of choosing to be in this space. I'm Elian Sadika from Elbin, the Latino Business Action Network. And I'm Julie Calantigua, Alban alum and founder of LWC Studios. We invite you to join us on Scale, the Latino Business Store, the first podcast from Elbin. On Scale, we speak with Latino business leaders who've grown their companies well beyond a million dollars in annual revenue to 10, a hundred, a billion dollars. And they come ready to tell us how they did it. We actually started with one employee, which was me. They reflect and get real about the game-changing business lessons along the way. Integrity is built over time and your reputation is valuable. So I've never lost sight of that. Follow and subscribe to Scale, the Latino business story, anywhere you get your podcast, And connect with Elban on social at Elban Strong. Whew, that was tough. I really, really feel for Sylvia. And I feel for her because I've been there. Five years ago when I decided to leave a very long and very successful career in media to start my own company, I had the hardest time explaining it to my mom. Of everyone that I wanted to explain it to, she took the longest. And that made sense because she had worked so hard to put me and my siblings through college to make sure that we were professional and prepared and uh, most of all, that we would be able to take care of ourselves. So how do you explain walking away from all that security, walking away from years, sometimes decades of effort put into a career? That's what we're going to talk about today. And many of us, especially through and after the pandemic, have looked at our jobs and our careers with fresh eyes. Some of us left unfulfilling roles or walked away from workplaces where we felt undervalued or downright discriminated against. But explaining these decisions to our parents can be nearly impossible, especially when to them it may seem like we're walking away from something that we and everyone in the family worked so hard for. So how do we do it? To help us figure it out, I called in an expert. I'm Michelle Espino Lira. I'm a professor and I study Latino, Latina, Latinx pathways to higher education. So you are the right person to talk about this. Tell me what you heard in Sylvia's story as you listened. Oh my gosh. The first thing I just gasped, it makes me so sad that we could very well have missed a wonderful intellectual scholar who um, I think in many ways was sabotaged 
that was the first thing I, I wanted to empathize with her journey. And, and unfortunately, it's a journey that many Latinx, Latina, Latino faculty experience in higher education. It can be a very toxic work environment. And then for her to have to explain to her family about moving on from a job that seems stable, seems safe when it's really not that safe. Tell us, what does your research reveal about these types of situations that Sylvia was in? You know, there has been so much work through decades of research in higher education about the experiences of Black, Indigenous, people of color, Latinx faculty. And for some reason, we still can't seem to get it right. There is extensive racism, microaggressions that people experience, these kinds of slights or indignities that people have that people sometimes think to themselves, now, what did that mean? Did I hear that right? So like they spend so much energy trying to make sense of messages that they receive like in person or through the policies. They spend so much energy doing that that they can't focus on the work of doing the scholarship. They don't have mentorship. And that is a huge issue that I I hope Sylvia did have, but it's very possible that she may not have had mentorship, which created this challenge about four or five years into her career. So in a way, it's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy and deficit that if we don't have enough faculty of color who can then mentor faculty of color, the institutional barriers and the sort of like sociological injuries that they experience run them out the door. Mm -hmm. Early. It's just it's, it's just incredible. But I do want to talk about sort of like it's a double jeopardy situation that she's in. Already, there's an implicit risk that she took, especially when she decided to file a lawsuit. It's a huge risk. And then there's the compounded risk of having to explain why you're doing this to your parents who helped you to get here. Please help me unpack this. Oh, gosh. I, I Sometimes I, I feel the same way. As a first-generation college student, uh, my dad came from Mexico the messages that we have grown up with of, of honoring our families by doing well and being successful. And it's really hard to explain that it's not just about the work. It's about being in environments that are affirming and validating for us mm -hmm. that it isn't just about a job, but that she really felt connected to her identity and how she feels about um, the kind of work that she wanted to do. And it's really hard to explain that, to say, I don't want to work in an environment that isn't going to help me to flourish. When our families are used to taking whatever job they could yep. to help help us however they could, right? So the lawsuit, definitely my eyes popped open. Yeah. Because we are in a very litigious society, but Latinos are... I would say, with no facts to back me up, the <laughs> least litigious complaining people in this country. <laughs> the whole, and, and it's interesting because there's this um, research tank called um, Equis Labs, mm -hmm. and they've come up with this term that I love. Latinos have what they're terming the guest complex. Mm. Like, even though we've been here generation upon generation, we still feel like we're guests. And because we feel socially, politically, economically that we're guests, we never ask for anything. We never ruffle any feathers. We never complain about things. And to me, when Sylvia had to go and tell her parents, part of the reaction was like, well, wait, why? Why, like, why would you do that? And so how do we get our parents earlier Right. Because that filing lawsuit is radical. But I'm sure throughout her educational experience, there were other ways that she experienced injustice and prejudice and biases. So how do we begin earlier to have a conversation with our parents so that we can grow their understanding? Because it is true that it gets more pervasive and more subtle the higher you move socially and economically. That's just a fact. And that is not to say that our parents did not experience these things because they did. And they actually experienced them really brazenly 
emotionally in many instances, right? But it is very different the higher you climb. You know, first gen, we're living in multiple worlds. We've been translators for our families our whole lives. And now we're having to translate the professional world in many respects and navigating in these elite spaces yet again. So there's never a time where we're not translating. And I don't always think that it's a skill that we think of as an asset. I think it's really hard for parents. And there is this kind of sense of guilt on both sides. I can see where parents can feel, wow, I've worked so hard to help my child to be successful in these spaces, but then they're not, you know, they're not finding fulfillment or they're not happy, right? And so I think it's really hard to prepare families because you're going through it as well. But I do think it's important to continue that communication because at one point it will start to make sense or they'll start to see the realities of what you're experiencing. Well, she also recounts the conversation in which her parents essentially said, but you and your sister made it so others can too. I mean, that is an iceberg of guilt right there. Mm -hmm. What do we do with that? That, I think, is the, the resilience and the resolve is something that we do learn from our families. And yet that isn't always something that's pointed out to them either about how much they, that that struggle inspired us to struggle too, but, but also to understand that there's limitations to that now. To struggle in our lives all the time is <laughs> just overwhelming. And we know that there's like, you know, health issues that result, you know, result in that. And so if they're fighting for us to have a better life, that includes a quality of life. That also means standing up for what we believe in and saying, I wasn't raised to be treated in this way. How can people listening to you today and thinking about starting or continuing or stopping an academic career, how can they strengthen themselves? How can they find support? How can they create pathways to success if this is what they want to be doing? First and foremost, it is possible. You can do this. The biggest thing is to ensure that you have people not just in the institution to help you because often we are the only ones, um, mm -hmm. as Sylvia shared. And so it's important to develop a network, a national network, an international network of people that believe in you and trust in you and validate who you are as a person and not just as a scholar. I call them my brother-sister scholars. They're very important to me. They are my ride or dies. I meet them at conferences. I network. That's really important. So it's about developing friends within the academy. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other thing is, is understanding that these institutions were not built for us. They're not in intended to be built for us. And so we have to make that room and we have to tear down some of these barriers and um, so that the next one coming after us can have maybe a smoother path. This is not easy. And I think for me, what drives me the most, it's the fact that I am, as many Black women scholars have said, we write ourselves into existence. And this is that's the research. So for me, it's research about our gente and helping Latinx, Latina, Latino communities to, to see the assets that their families bring to them. And so I, I do, that's the research that I do. It's a calling that I'm doing. And so the institution can be the institution, but I'm writing for our people. And that's what matters to me. I love that answer. Honestly, your audience is not the institution. Your audience is the people whose work you're elevating, the people whose lives you're understanding better, the people who you're bringing evidence about. That's your audience. And I think that a lot of us, because we spend years, sometimes decades, striving to get to certain places, the arrival and the place itself feels like it's the audience, but it's really not, mm -hmm. right? And so I love that you said that in this context, because I believe it's really applicable in all kinds of contexts. If you figure out who the intended audience for your work is, it will be so clarifying. You're a gem. Thank you so much for coming on. Please come back. Thank you. Okay, 
Here's what we learned from Michelle. Connect to their efforts and goals. Your parents worked really hard so that you would have a better quality of life. So when you need to explain major shifts, point out that advocating for your highest quality of life is exactly how you honor their hard work and sacrifice. Embrace the translator role, literally and figuratively. You will probably always need to interpret some aspects of your world for your parents. So be patient and use this set of skills to keep the conversation going. And remember, focus on your purpose and your audience. Stay connected to the work you're doing and who you are really doing it for. This will give you clarity as you make difficult career decisions and discuss them with your loved ones. Thank you for listening and sharing us. How to Talk to Mommy and Papi About Anything is an original production of LWC Studios. Virginia Lora is our show's producer. Kojin Tashiro is our mixer. Elizabeth Nakano mixed this episode. Manuela Bedoya is our marketing lead. And Juleka Lantigua is the creator and host. I'm senior editor Monica Lopez. On Twitter and Instagram, we're at Talk to Mommy Papi. Bye, everybody. Same place next week. <laughs>